Tonight, um, we're going to be going through the book, and um, we're going to be covering um, four chapters tonight. Chapter 6, which is the predicate principle. Chapter 7, the application principle. Chapter 8, the principle of types or typology. And then chapter 9, which we will have Pastor Alfred. And uh, it's an honor to have him here. We will have Pastor Alfred teaching <clears throat> chapter 9, which is on the principle of human willingness in illumination. So we're going to cover four chapters tonight, so it would be good. All right. So um, if you have your, your books, I'm not going to go over everything in the book and, because you can go through the book. So if I just stood here and basically read through the book, that's, that's not teaching. That's just repetition. But we're going to focus in on key points in the book. Um, we're also going to have a, a, a pop quiz tonight. No pressure. It'll be fun. Open notes. Just relax. You know, no tension. Don't run out the door. That's why I got Pastor Alfred in the back. <laughs> you know, anyone who tries to run out the door... Between him and Wendell, you know, and actually it's, it's really good to have um, Pastor Alfred's wife, Sandra, and his two kids here. So, you know, that's amazing. Okay, so um, while you have uh, open up your books, also open up to Exodus chapter 7, okay? And if you don't have a book, you can still follow through. And then just when you get home, if you didn't bring your book, you can go through your book at home. Chapter 6, page 37, I think. Yeah? Okay. So, chapter 6. All right. So the predicate, pre predicate, Pred predictive <laughs> principle. Ah. And um, just, you know, I, I love the point here is there's a difference between prophecy and prediction. Uh, do we, and, and that's very important in the day and age we live in because the word prophecy or prophetia, prophet, there was always two aspects of prophecy. Um, foretelling or what we call prediction, something that will happen. And the other one is foretelling. Okay, and that is very crucial because it makes the difference between um, rightly interpreting scripture. Remember, this is hermeneutics. This is the art of interpreting scripture. But you can never interpret scripture one without God himself, without the filling of the Holy Spirit, and two, without its proper context. And sad to say, we live in a day and age where people have taken the Bible, the Word of God, out of context, and they have twisted scriptures to their own destruction. So it's very important as students of the Bible that we rightly interpret so we can rightly apply, right? And then there would be a proper illumination of the Word of God, okay? So what do we mean by uh, foretelling, okay? Foretelling was this a prophet, and, and it says here that a prophet was essentially God's spokesman, spokesman, and his role, sole mission was to speak the Word of God and only the words which God gave him to speak. That was so, that's crucial. Because remember, the prophet never ever divorced himself from the relationship with the one who was giving the prophecy. It didn't, he never looked at it from, what can I gain out of this? And it's sad to say we see that so much in Christianity today. It's no longer what is God's heart. But how does this profit me, not profit God? And we see that so much. We see people using the Bible 
to bring profit or bring adding to themselves. You know, and it's dangerous because it's a misinterpretation of the character and nature of God. And that is very important when we look at the Word of God. Never ever study the Bible and take the Bible outside of the character and nature of God. Because you know what happens then? The letter kills. It doesn't build people up. It doesn't produce a capacity. It actually robs them of a relationship with the Lord. So it says here that the prophet was essentially God's spokesman, spokesman and his sole mission was to speak the word of God and only the words which God gave him to speak. And we see an example of Jonah. Okay, now, in Exodus chapter 7, who wrote the book of Ex uh, Exodus? Moses. Was Moses a prophet? Yes. The first five books of Moses, is, is the first five books of Scripture, the first five books of Moses. Verse 1 says this, And the Lord said unto Moses, See, I have made thee a god to Pharaoh, and Aaron thy brother shall be thy prophet. And thou shalt speak all that I command thee, and Aaron thy brother shall speak unto Pharaoh, and that he send the children of Israel out of his land. Aaron was a prophet to Moses. He spoke God, it was like a relationship. Moses received from God, and then Moses communicated to Aaron, and Aaron spoke, for, spoke forth what was on Moses' heart. And the key thing was that it was not like, okay, Aaron said, okay, uh, well, Moses, I don't, know, I don't know why we should say that. And it's interesting, this word command, it's the word, it means to make something firm, to establish, to ordain, to delegate, to set in order. Once again, it means to make firm, to establish, to ordain, to delegate, to set in order. I'm sorry, order. Set in order. Okay? And that's key. Because prophecy and profit went hand in hand. The prophet spoke forth prophecy. Let me ask you this question. What is our Bible? Prophecy. So is it any wonder why today no one reads the Bible? Think about it. No one reads their Bible. Churches, you can find churches where there is no Bible. You can find pastors where there is no Bible. But Satan what, Satan hates the Bible. So his plan would be to either remove the Bible or misinterpret what God has said. Matthew 4, 4. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. And that word, word, is the word rhema personal words from God. Man's to live by how many words? Every word. So how can I live by every word if I don't receive every word? And that is crucial. So, key point was that the prophet, he said, you, I command you to speak all, all that I command you. And that brings up a point. The point is this, that it wasn't, the idea of prophecy wasn't just something external. And what do I mean by that? Okay, It's easy for someone to hear something and speak forth what they've heard, but never let it get internalized. And that's dangerous. Because you can speak forth, like I go and I give the gospel to someone, but I don't believe in the gospel. So what does it do? It, tra it may transform the person, but it doesn't transform me. And that was the key thing for a prophecy and a prophet. 
was that first of all, the prophet's relationship with the one who was giving the prophecy, God. Isaiah chapter 6. Isaiah was God's prophet, but we see the conversion of Isaiah in Isaiah chapter 6. He says, woe is me, for I am a man undone, and I dwell in the midst of people that are undone, and mine eyes have seen the Lord. And then God, and this is amazing, this is the finished work. God takes a coal from off of the altar and purges Isaiah's lips. That's the finished work. It's God's work, and we are receivers of what God has done. And then there's a transformation that happens. And all of a sudden, Isaiah hears these words, Who will go for us? And what was Isaiah's response? Here am I. You know, and when God spoke to Moses in Exodus chapter 3, Moses all of a sudden talked about his ability or his inability to be God's servant. Right? He said, God, you don't understand. I, I, you know, I've been on the backside of the desert. I tried to do this. I tried. But the call of God comes with it, the enablement from God. That's key to understand as a believer. God's call in our lives comes with the enablement of that call. So the prophet was enabled by God to speak forth God's prophecy. Okay? And another thing the prophet was supposed to, or was re, God impressed to the prophet was not to be afraid of the faces that he would face. Because why? And we look in, in the Old Testament. A prophet was not received by the people. But did it change the fact that he was called? No. When you go soul winning, you may not be received from people. But does it change the fact that God called you to go soul winning? No. As a believer walking before God in your family, you may not be received. But does it change the fact that God's called you? No. Okay? So, I love it here. Point, on the point number two, it says, uh, a prophet is God's spokesman. He is not only a foreteller, excuse me, too much base there, foreteller, but a fourth teller of the word of God. And it says this, primarily a prophet was not a foreteller, but, a fore, but he foretold the word of God. Key, foretold. Now, it brings up a point. Do we have prophets today that foretell the word of God? No. Why? Because the canon of Scripture is closed. That, I mean, that is so crucial as a believer. It's something we, we think about, like, oh, yeah, sure. There's no, but there are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of, of churches that someone will stand up and say thus saith the Lord and because people are not trained they will follow the prophet do you know what, what, what one of the tests of a prophet was what happens as a prophet if you said something and it didn't come true you were killed immediately it dealt with self-ordained prophets. It dealt with it. Now, today we don't stone people, and today we don't kill people, but you know what? What does kill people? The letter. The letter kills. It's the spirit that gives life. So that's why there is no need for a prophet today. Why? Because if a prophet is today the one who foretold then the Bible has lost its authority. 2 Timothy 3.16, all scripture is inspired by God and is profitable for reproof, for correction. Let's, let's turn there because it's very important. These are verses that we can quote, but these are verses that are key as a believer. 
Ben, should I keep my head up? Okay. All right. Second Timothy chapter three. Let's look at verse 13. Actually, let's look at verse 10. But thou hast fully known my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith, long-suffering, charity, patience, persecutions, afflictions, which came unto me at Antioch, at Iconium, at Lystra, what persecutions I endured, but out of them all the Lord delivered me. Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. But evil men and seducers shall work, wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. But continue thou in the things which you have learned and has been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them, and, from a, and that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. All scripture is given by inspiration of God, and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect or mature, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. All scriptures inspire. So the prophet's authority came from God. And before the canon of scripture was closed, the assurance or the authenticity of that prophet was that what they said came to pass. If it didn't, they died. Okay? There was no problem. So there were not people running to become prophets. On the contrary, they were running against the office of being a prophet. Moses, what did Moses say? Send someone else, God. I don't want to be the person. Send someone else. Isaiah, I am a man undone. Jeremiah, I'm a child. All of God's prophets, if they looked at their own ability, they realized they were inadequate. There was one, Saul. He was head and shoulders above everyone else. But Nathan, the prophet, said to him, when you were small in your own eyes, God anointed you. Humility. And that's what Pastor Alfred, we will talk about in chapter 9. The importance of the willingness and brokenness and humbleness of the vessel where there comes illumination. All right. So, next point. Uh, and we talked about the first, which was foretelling. And then we also talked about foretelling. All right. Now... key point when we think of interpretation okay uh, what interprets the Bible the Bible okay scripture interprets scripture okay we know in 2nd Timothy I'm sorry 2nd Peter chapter 1 verse 19 let's turn there Second Peter, Chapter One. Okay. Now, was Peter considered as a prophet? He was an apostle, but he also was a prophet. Okay? Now, as a prophet, this is what he says. Verse 18. And actually, verse 17. For he received from God, speaking about Christ, the Father, honor and glory, when there came such a voice to him from the excellent glory, this is my beloved Son, in whom I'm well pleased. And this voice which came from heaven we heard when we were with him in the holy mount. 
Okay, so Peter is, he's talking about to the church that he was an eyewitness of Christ. Okay, his authority. But look what he says in verse 19. We have also a more sure word of prophecy. Whereunto you do well that you take heed as unto a light that shines in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts. Knowing this, that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of men, but holy men spake as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. Okay? Now, Peter is saying that I heard, we heard the Father's voice. But we have a more sure word of prophecy. And what is he referring to? The Bible. Okay? Because the Bible, it's like, all right, someone can say, well, I heard the voice of God. Well, what tells us that Peter heard the voice of God? Were we there? Was any of us on the mountain? Transfiguration. So how do we know? It's, in, it's written, the Word of God. So it's a check. It's a check for our lives. The Bible is what checks me to truth. So without it, what's truth? How do you know someone is speaking truth? You don't know. You're left to private interpretation. And that's what it says in verse um, 20. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. We've, we learned this and we talked about this before. It's the word idiotis, which means that which belongs to you. See, the prophet never ever could say, this is my, this is what I think you should do. He, he could never ever separate himself and say, okay God, this is what you said, but uh, I think this is better. Perfect example, Jonah. Right? What did God say to Jonah? Go to Nineveh. What did Jonah say? No. And Jonah went the opposite way. But did Jonah, even when he was in a tight situation, could he lie? No. He couldn't lie. When he was on the boat and he said, why is this storm here? He like, I don't know. Oh, why is this here? You, know, you got any ideas? No, I don't know. He said, it's because of me. My God. See, so the prophet could never ever falsify the authority that was given to him. That's an amazing point for pastors, for believers. Because we realize that, you know what? The call of God is very important. So I don't take it lightly representing this Bible, or standing in this pulpit. You know, it's an amazing thing. It's so, it's so good to fear and reverence God. Not a fear that runs away from God, but a realization that God is God and I am not. That's healthy. That's what Nathan said to Saul. When you were little in your own eyes, God anointed you. It's amazing. You know, so it's, it means private interpretation, or I interpret it myself. Now, um, listen to this. This is, I'll just give you some points on what we have that's more sure, okay? Right, the word more sure is the word bebaios, B-E-B-A-I-O-S in the Greek. B-E-B-A-I-O-S. It means to build. It means something firm, something fixed, something certain, something reliable, something trustworthy. It has the idea of faithfulness, never failing, unwavering, immovable. I'll say those words again. To build being firm, fixed, certain, reliable, trustworthy, faithful, never fail, unwavering, immovable. 
I like that. Immovable. We have an immovable prophecy. Word of prophecy. It's immovable. Why? Because it's built on the character and nature of God, which is immovable. All right? Some verses. Romans 4.16 says, to the end, the promise would be immovable. To the intention that the promises of God are immovable. Okay? That's Romans 4.16. Excuse me. 2 Corinthians... 1 7 says we have a hope that is steadfast or more sure or immovable or fixed. Okay. Hebrews 6 19. It says we have a hope as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast. It's the word bebaios. The word steadfast meaning immovable. That's Hebrews 6.19. Psalm 19 verse 7 says God's testimony is sure. It is immovable. It is fixed. It is reliable. It is steadfast. That's Psalm 19 verse 7. Isaiah chapter 22 verse 23 and 25 it says that grace Means it says a sure nail, speaking about the grace of God, is immovable. It's fixed. It's Isaiah chapter 22, verse 23 and 25. Why is that important? Because in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 says, we are saved by grace. It's something fixed, certain, sure, reliable, and immovable. Therefore, Someone cannot lose their salvation because it's based upon the character and nature of God and not the character and nature of the person. That's why interpretation is very important. And the next uh, principle we'll talk about is application. Okay? This is why if, if I don't get the interpretation right, then the application is off. That's how important the Bible is. Not just the letter, but the Holy Spirit's character and nature. The anointing of the Holy Spirit in the Word of God. Okay? Isaiah chapter 28, verse 16, says we have an immovable foundation. Speaking of Jesus Christ himself. The cornerstone, a sure foundation. Okay? That cannot be moved. It's amazing. I was, I, was, I was thinking today as I saw a little clip of the, um, the devastation in Japan. It's how easily that water moved objects. Planes, cars, trucks, houses. How easily it was moved. But you know what's amazing? God, when we, are, when we understand our relationship and our identity in Christ... Nothing moves us. It doesn't mean we will not go through difficult times. Were the, were the prophets hated? Of course. But uh, Paul said this in, in Acts chapter 20, verse 24 and 27. None of these things move me. Neither do I count my life dear unto myself, that I may finish my course with joy, and the ministry that I received of the Lord Jesus Christ to testify of the gospel of the grace of God. It's amazing that for a believer to be founded in truth, not to be moved. Okay? Isaiah chapter 55, verse 3 says, We have the sure mercies of David. And that word sure is immovable mercies. And what is mercy for? Mercy t deals with the effects of my sin. And that's important because sin can cause me to be moved. But when I understand what God has done about my sin, that his mercies in Lamentations uh, 3, 22 and 23 are new every morning and says great is his faithfulness. 
Great is his stability. He's fixed. Great is his faithfulness. Okay? And then 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 19 says, The foundation of God stands sure. Okay, we talked about in Isaiah chapter 28, verse 18 and 19, that Christ is the foundation, and that the foundation of God stands sure. Okay? Uh, I thought of another verse. Actually, let me... This is good. Matthew chapter 16, verse 18. I say unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Okay? The gates of hell cannot move the church, which is founded upon Christ and not Peter. Okay? Now, before we go on to the principle of practical application, are there any questions about anything we've talked about? Uh, if it's in the book, I didn't go over everything in that chapter because you can read it. You know, there's a lot of verses and it's very good. But, um, okay, so, all right, let's look at the next prince, chapter 7. How we doing? Doing all right? How you doing, Justin? Okay. All right, application. Is it possible to have the right interpretation and the wrong application? Yeah. Yes, <laughs> we've, we've, we've learned that. Okay, it is very important. This principle of application, um, there have been a lot of people that rightly interpret the Bible, but wrongly apply that interpretation. Okay? Um, you know one area that we, we often see that in is in counseling. Okay? The danger for the counselor to take the Bible and apply it incorrectly to the person they are counseling. Okay? Because why? That person, the counselee, stands or falls before God, not the counselor. I mean, Pastor Stevens would always say that after every message, he says, I've done my part. Now the rest is up to you. Presented, interpreted the word of God correctly. Now the application is with the believer. And that is key. So I love it says point one. And this is a definition. Okay. The principle by which an application of truth may be made only after the, in, after the correct interpretation has been learned. It says, this means that when you study the Bible, you must first seek the proper interpretation of the text, the exact meaning always, and the literal meaning. You ought never to take a text and preach on it without examining the words of the text. You know what? Pastor Alfred can tell you, there are so many preachers that have taken a portion of the Bible, just take a verse out of the Bible, and gone with it without understanding what they were preaching. Or a believer takes a portion out of the Scripture and incorrectly applies and understands what that verse says. You know, perfect example we see today is divorce. It says, oh, the Bible says, be not unequally yoked. Well, you know, that says it before you got married. <laughs> you know, someone gets saved and they say, I read the Bible, oh, the Bible says I'm not supposed to be unequally yoked, so I'm going to divorce my... No. Because it also says in 1 Peter chapter 3 that the, unbe the believing husband can win the unbelieving wife. That's why Scripture interprets Scripture. Isaiah 28, verse 10 and 13. Line upon line, 
precept upon precept. Perfect illustration is building a wall, a brick wall. You lay the foundation, and the other brick goes right on top of it, and the other line goes right on top. And you know what you use to make sure that wall is straight? Plumb line. It's a standard. And I remember Pastor Shallow taught in class, amazing. That like it just it stays right there and it cannot lie. The plumb line is the word of God. The plumb line is the grace of God. It can never lie. It can be used in China, it can be used in America. It can be used 400 years ago, it can be 400 years in the future. It's the same principle, it's a standard. Okay? And then next point, and I like with this, that uh, this point which is important is that there may be many applications, but there is only one interpretation. What do we mean by that? Okay. Matthew 4.4. 4. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. So the interpretation is that the Bible, this is what it says, well, God's not here, and I can't see the Bible coming out of God's mouth, so I guess I can't live by it. That's not what the Bible is saying. The mouth of God speaks about his word. Okay, Jesus, the living word, became the written word. Okay, that was the living word speaking, but he was speaking about the written word. So someone will say, well, you know, Jesus is not here. And he's the one who said that verse, so uh, I, I've never seen... And can I ask a question? Can you see words out of someone's mouth? <laughs> right? Can you see words out of my mouth? No. But what can we do? Hear. Hear. And the Bible speaks so much about hearing, being careful what you hear, Mark 4, 24, and be careful how you hear, Luke 8, 38. Hold on. Let me turn there. I get these two mixed up. Luke, Matthew, Mark, 8. Hmm. Luke 8, 18, sorry. Mark 4.24 and Luke 8.18. Luke 8.18 says, Take heed, therefore, how you hear. Mark 4.24 is, Take heed what you hear. Okay, so our hearing is key. Okay? So, now, actually, let's, before we go forward with the application principle, I wanted, I wanted to do something regarding prophecy. Okay. Remember when we were talking about Scripture, interpreting Scripture? Okay. And um, we talked about the importance of the Bible. And I and I kind of skip I kind of went through that quickly, but I, I didn't want to, because it's important. All right. What the Bible says. Okay. Now think about this. This is some verses, when we talked about not a private interpretation, or one's own interpretation. This is important. Listen listen to these verses. You can write them down. Daniel chapter 10, verse 21, says the scripture of truth. This is why scriptures are important. Daniel 10, 21. Luke 4, 21. Jesus said, 
this day, this scripture is fulfilled in your ears. We know when in Luke 4, 18, he says, for the spirit of the Lord has anointed me to preach. And he says in verse 21, this day, this scripture is fulfilled in your ears. John 7, 42 says, hath not the scripture said? I'll say the verse again. John 7, 42 says, Hath not the scripture said? And why is that important? Because, see, if we are not people of the book, then our reasoning will be outside of the word of God. Are you with me? It's very important. If I am not a man or a woman of the book, I was listening to a message from Pastor Stevens from 1974. He spoke of the book of Joshua and how that Joshua was a man of the book and the importance of being a man or a woman of the book. And so John 7.42 says, Hath not the scripture said? John 10.35 says that the scriptures cannot be broken. I love that. The Bible cannot be broken. It means it cannot be divided. There's a thought from Genesis to Revelation. And God's desire is that we would understand the full thought. And in chapter 10, we're going to talk about the principle of uh, first mention. The first time something was mentioned in the Bible. But sometimes someone takes that first mention and they don't go any further. And they build a whole doctrine on that first mention. But what does the scripture say? Line. There's a line running through the Bible. Redemption runs from Genesis all the way to Revelation. It's a line. Yep, scarlet thread through the Bible. Okay? Um, so, in, and then I love this, this statement, that the scriptures may be fulfilled. John 13, 8. John 17, 12. John 13, 8. John 17, 12. John 19, 24. John 19, 28. John 19, 36. Acts 1, 16. So John 13, 18. 17, 12. 19, 24. 19, 28. 19, 36. And Acts 1, 16 says that the scripture may be fulfilled. John 20, verse 9 says... They knew not the scripture. And that sounds like today. You ever hear someone who's like, that person doesn't know the Bible. They've wrongly interpreted the Bible, and they're wrongly applying the Bible. Okay? Sad to say, like, a, like an event of today. Okay? And, and it was a tragedy. But you, you will have some people who says, you know what? God is the one who destroyed all those people. Well, you know, I mean, is God willing that people would perish without Christ? No. Was that the hand of God? Yes. But does it mean that God is like, is all the, God wants to destroy all the Japanese? No, he doesn't. That's a wrong understanding of truth. But do you see where people can stray away from the scriptures and take their own personal understanding of an event in life? And throw it on you, a burden. And there are hundreds of churches that we see that in. People are not set free. They are burdened because people don't know the scriptures. All right? Romans 4 3 and Galatians 4 30 says, For what says the scripture? What does the Bible say? That's our, that's our solution. Someone says, wait a minute, what does the Bible say? I know what you say, but what does the Bible say? Why? Because Matthew 4.4, 4, I am to live by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. So what does the Bible say? Okay, 2 Timothy 3.16 says, all scripture is given by inspiration, meaning it's breathed by God. All scripture is breathed by God. 
And God does not have bad breath. Okay? So when I, when I hear the word of God, it should produce in me a desire, not running away from God. If I'm running away from God, then that's the wrong interpretation of truth. When Jesus, were people drawn to Christ? Yes. To the point where they wanted to kill him. Because he says he receives sinners. Amen. Luke 19.10, for the Son of Man has come to seek and save that which is lost. The Pharisees, they wanted nothing to do with him. And they were supposed to be the prophets of the day. Yet they rejected Christ. Okay? Now, think about this, and I'll give you a couple more verses. And then Matthew 21.42, I love this. It says, have you never read in the scriptures... Pastor Belli preaches uh, this message in Uganda. He just kept saying, have you never read the scriptures? He say, uh, believe in women pastors. Have you never read the scriptures? You believe in speaking to us. Have you never read the scriptures? What does the Bible say? Because if I understand what the Bible says, I will understand everything that the Bible doesn't say. Right? Simple. So it's not any confusion. The confusion is when I don't know what the Word of God says. So then I'm left to private interpretation. Okay? So that was Matthew 21, 42. Matthew 22, verse 29, Jesus said, You do err not knowing the Scriptures. That was Matthew 22, verse 29, and Mark 12, verse 24. In Luke 24, 27, on the road of Emmaus, Jesus expounded to them all the scriptures. That word expounds me. He unveiled. He, 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 he um, caused to, to grow or to stretch. He expound or to enlighten the scriptures. That's Luke 24, 27. Yep, hermeneutics. That's where we get hermeneutics from. Luke 24, 32, I love this, it says, Did not our hearts, our hearts burn within us while he talked with us by the way and while he opened to us the scriptures? Did not our hearts burn within us? Luke 24, uh, Luke 24 32. Luke 24, 42, Then he opened their understanding that they might understand the scriptures. That was Luke 24, 42. John 5, 39. Jesus said to the uh, Pharisees, You search the scriptures, but you won't come unto me. There are people who search the Bible analytically to try to disprove the Bible, but they won't come to Christ. And I love the uh, statement of Pastor Steve's when he gave his testimony. He was trying to disprove the Bible, but it brought him to Christ. He fell in love with the Bible, and he kept saying, that's fair. As he, as he looked to try to disprove the Bible, he kept coming to the point of saying, that's fair, that's right. And he got converted, a Unitarian, and got saved. And then he wrote a track, you know, talked about the truth, certain certainties, okay? The Bible, if, if you can get that message, it's a hallmark, go, on, go online, you can download it. Certain certainties. It's amazing what is certain, okay? Um, Acts 17, verse 2, Paul reasoned with them out of the scriptures. The Bible, it's the Bible. If you're going to talk to people, talk to them about the Bible. If they don't want to talk to the Bible, don't talk to them. Because you know, you're not going to be able to convince someone by reasoning, just logic. It's the Bible. Okay? Acts 17, verse 11. I love this. The Bereans searched the scriptures daily. Okay, that's Acts 17, verse 11. Right. Acts 18, 24, 
Apollos was mighty in the scriptures. He was a great orator, but he needed to understand body life. Okay, he was a great man by himself, but, but a Priscilla and Aquila brought him near to teach him more personal application of the Word of God. Acts 18.28, Paul showing that Jesus is the Christ by the Scriptures, by the Bible. Okay, Romans 1.2 and 2 Timothy 3.15, it's called the Holy Scriptures, the Holy Bible, set apart unto God. God's thoughts. Romans 15, verse 4, the scriptures produce patience and comfort. Romans 15, verse 4. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 3, Jesus died for our sins according to the scriptures. That's 1 Corinthians 15, 3. And last, 1 Corinthians 15, 4, Jesus rose from the dead on the third day, according to the scriptures. Okay, so this is why it's so important, like applying the Bible in our lives, it's the Bible. It can't be private interpretation. It can't be my feelings. Why? My feelings will lie to me. If I try to apply the Bible according to my feelings, I will misinterpret truth. Okay? It says in uh, 1 Corinthians 7, 1, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. That's what the Bible says. But if a guy reads and says, well, you know, um, because I am uh, a theological student in the Bible, I think that I have conquered that verse, and I think I can touch a woman. Wrong. You have erred not knowing the scriptures. Okay? This is what preserves our lives. Okay, it says that um, what profit shall a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? What does the scripture say? And that's a good practice for our own lives when a thought comes in. This is a good verse, uh, 2 Corinthians 10, 4 through 6. Casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself above the word of God. Bring it to captivity. Whether it's from within or whether it's from without. It's the Bible. What does God say? And take the time. Take the time to know what God says. Okay? So when we, th when we think of application, at this point, I love what it says here. That there may be many applications, but there is only one correct interpretation of Scripture. Only one. As God intended it. Okay, as God intended it, not man. If you put man into the equation, you got a problem. Because man will twist the scriptures. He will corrupt the scriptures. He will pervert the scriptures. Okay, but all scripture is breathed by God. All right? And then I, I love this point when it says point E, hindrances and in interpretation. This is so good. A desire for applause of the world. That is a hindrance to proper interpretation. It's the word we say, a fair show in the flesh, or men pleasers. If I desire to be accepted, I will misinterpret the Bible. To my own destruction, sad to say. But that's what will happen. Okay? And point number two, other hindrance to scripture is vanity and flattery may lean, lead to blindness of the scriptures. Flattery and vanity. Did, did Solomon have the Bible? Did Solomon err from the Bible? Why? Vanity and flattery. It's amazing, you know. I, I think about, you know, I was, um, as Shal was saying in service, how when Abraham Lincoln heard the Bible being preached, he sat on the edge of his chair 
and his mouth was open. It was like, like it, because as a president, the word of God was penetrating his soul. And he realized that his authority, there was authority above him. And that's healthy in office. Moses said to the judges that before you judge the people, realize that God is over you. So you don't give false judgment in court. Okay? Well, in Zambia, uh, the president, um, when he did the inauguration, he says, this country, he, he held up the Bible, he read the Bible, and he said, the Bible will rule this country. That's what you need. Not the letter, okay, but the life. All right? So, now, point number three. It says, study without regularity and without system. Okay, now this means this, like this is like, um, it means freshness when you study. Okay, because if you just study the Bible like, okay, like it's a, it's a, uh, um, what's, what's the illustration I can say? I don't even know good illustration. Something that's just dull and mundane, boring, you know, like, uh, Wrote? Like, yeah, like, like, a, like, like mathematics. One plus one is two. One plus one is two. One, you know, like, it can become dry. But it's like meeting God. Matthew eleven twenty eight through 30. It says, learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your soul. So the danger of just studying the Bible, like, I just, got, I just got to get through it. I just got to get through it, okay? I just got to get through it. It's dangerous in interpretation. But meeting God, I love it. It's a booklet. Meeting God every morning. Meeting God in the Word, okay? All right, let's just go through this next um, principle. Now, I wanted to give you, and you can just, just, I wanted to give you, and I'll have Ula type this out. Um, yeah, we'll have Ula type this out. And um, if, if you have, how many have a um, Thompson Chain Bible? Okay, that's good. If you can, get a Thompson Chain Bible. It's a great study Bible. Okay? Thompson Chain and Zodiac, like two Bibles. But um, I was just looking at today prophecies and fulfillment of prophecy concerning Christ. This will, this, is, this will help us as we go into types. Actually, let's go into types first, and then we'll, we'll talk about that. Okay? How many um, before this class you've heard about the typical principle, types? Okay. How many of you never heard of a type? When you think of type, you're thinking like, <laughs> no, really. I, when I first heard type, I was like, okay, type, type like a typewriter. But I, I didn't understand what a type was in the Bible. You would read a portion of scripture and like, what are they talking about? You know? And, but it, it's in um, page 48, the typical principle. This is the definition of a type. Okay? How many are there? All right, page 48. It says, a type is a divinely appointed illustration of some scriptural truth. Key word, divinely appointed, which means where did it come from? God. Okay? God is the one who appointed the type. And the purpose of the type is to point to a fulfillment. And the Bible is full of types. The Old Testament was full of types. The tabernacle was full of types. Type of who? Christ. And this is important in interpretation, okay? Now, um, let's see here. It's from the word, it's the word tupos. It's the Greek, that's the Greek word, T-U-P-O-S. And it means a stamp, a mark, a pattern, 
a mold. You know what a mold is? It's like a cast mold. Like if you wanted to make um, a baseball bat. No. Uh, yeah, aluminum baseball bat, not a wood baseball bat. But if you wanted to make an aluminum baseball bat, you would first make a mold for that bat, then you would pour the aluminum in, and then you make, after you make them, then that's how you make your bat. It's a stamp. Okay, there used to be, um, I'm thinking a long time ago, um, Play-Doh. It's a good illustration. Yeah, Play-Doh with the molds, you know, and, and that's how you made little characters. You put it in a mold, and then you put the clay in, and you pressed it down, and you took out the person. And then you crushed them and put them back in. Okay? So, um, that's a mold. Okay, sorry for just such a simple, but that's one that came to mind. And maybe it's because I have a daughter. So, okay. My daughter plays with it. Lincoln Logs, it's better. Okay, all right. So my sister's nodding back. At, you guys know I have a sister in the class? Yeah. At the break, I'll introduce you to her. She prayed for my salvation for many, many years. And I thank God for her. It's great to have a godly sister. The camera, I, you know, she's under the camera so you can't even see her anyhow. Even if it panned. So, okay, so types. Um, so, in, there's also a, in the... Um, the word tupos, there's different classifications of types. Okay, and this is one of the principles of interpretation. Okay, um, it can be a person, an event, a thing, or a ritual. Okay, um, there are many rituals that happen that really don't point to Christ, that a lot of people do. And they, and they may say, oh, this is just a ritual we do, but the question is, what, what is it pointing to? Okay, uh, when we grew up, we grew up a certain, um, a certain faith where, you know, we, we always went and there was a certain time of the month that, that, that the priest would take and dip his finger and, and put a cross on our head. And it's like, you know, you grew up, you did it, and then you're all of a sudden like, okay, what does this mean? I understand the cross, but what about the ashes? You know, and these things, you know, it's like, but, but is it like the word, a type, a true type has a fulfillment that it points to? Okay? And we're going we're gonna to look at some of those types. You know, in the, um, the book of Hebrews, is a great, in the epistles, Talk about the fulfillment of types. It's a great book. Okay? And the writer of Hebrews, you know, who understood, had the background and understood the types in Jewish, uh, in the Jewish history and the fulfillment of those types pointed to Christ. Okay? And I'll just give some of them. Um, some of the types of persons. Moses spoke about a deliverer. Remember, Moses was used to deliver the children of Israel from Egypt or from Pharaoh's hands. Okay, Moses spoke about Christ, who would not only deliver for a point in time, but deliver forever from the bondage of sin. Okay, and we see that in Hebrews chapter 3. Aaron was the high priest, right? He was a type. Now, now, a type is also a real person in the case of a person. And was Aaron a real person? Yes. But Aaron spoke about he was a high priest who um, would enter in once to the holy place and that his priesthood would end when he died. Right? There would have to be a new priest. But he spoke about a type of Christ. But Christ was a high priest who would not just enter in 
every year to offer at the Day of Atonement, but once, not offering the, which is a type, the blood of the, the lamb, but his own blood, once and for all. Okay? The tabernacle was a type. The tabernacle spoke of the presence of God. That tabernacle and the fulfillment of the tabernacle is Christ. He is the presence of God. Okay? Uh, the law, the Levitical law, was a type. It spoke of God's standard. And the fulfillment of the law is who? Christ. He is the end of the law. The word teleos, he is the completion or the fulfillment of the law. Who gave the law? Moses brought the law, but who gave the law? God. Who is the only person who can fulfill the law? God. And it's amazing for people to think, for a person to think they can fulfill the law of God. They cannot. They are not God. How could someone think in their own ability they can fulfill the law of God? It's impossible. God gave it. God fulfilled it. And this is what we see in types. Okay, um, Adam was a type. Was he a real person? Okay, but he was a type of Christ. He was, Adam was the first Adam. Jesus is the last Adam. Okay, Revelation, I'm sorry, Romans 5, 14, 15 through 17, and 1 Corinthians 15, 22 and 25. So I'll, I'll say that again. Romans 5, 14, 15 through 17, and 1 Corinthians 15, 20 through 22 and 45. Okay. Romans 5, 14 and 15 through 17 and 1 Corinthians 15, verse 22 and 45. The fulfillment of the law, Christ being the law, end of the law is Hebrews 10, verse 1 and 2 through 4, verse 7, verse 9, and verse 12 through 22. That's Hebrews 10, verse 1, 2 through 4, 7, 9, 12 through 22. Tabernacle, Christ being the fulfillment, that's Hebrews chapter 9, verses 11 through 14, and verses 22 through 28. Hebrews 9, verses 11 through 14, and verses 22 through 28. And then for Aaron, being the high priest, Christ being the high priest forever, it's Hebrews chapter 4, verse 10. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 10. And Hebrews chapters 7 and 8. Hebrews 4, 10. Hebrews chapter 7 and 8. Okay, now, what I want to give you before we take a break is, and we're going to take a good lengthy break, and then we have a little pop quiz, and then Pastor Alfred is going to um, teach the final principle, and then we'll have a couple questions, and then we'll let you go. Okay, now... Um, prophecy and fulfillment. We talked about prophecy and fulfillment. And there are many prophecies in the Bible and they have been fulfilled. Okay? And there are many prophecies that haven't been fulfilled. Now, the principle of fulfillment, there was an immediate fulfillment and there was a future fulfillment of prophecy. Okay? So sometimes people get mistaken, they look at the media and say, well, yeah, that happened, and that's it. But often when the prophet spoke, he spoke, remember, Pastor Shalit, is a beautiful picture um, where you have mountain peaks, okay? You can see the top of the mountain, but you have no idea what's sitting between the mountains. And the prophet could see the top of the mountain, but he could not tell the distance between those mountain peaks, 
He had no idea how long this would happen or when it would be fulfilled. Okay? Now, um, and today I was thinking about specifically the prophecy of Christ and the fulfillment of that prophecy, which is amazing because you realize that God's plan and God fulfilled his own plan. Finished work. He planned it. He fulfilled it. We receive it. It's amazing. Okay? So, all right. Are you ready? All right. First prophecy and fulfillment, Christ, seed of the woman, Genesis 3.15. Because that's what we hear about, that the seed of the woman shall crush the head of the serpent, and the serpent shall bruise his heel. Fulfillment, Matthew 1.1, 1, 1, and Luke chapter 1. Actually, sorry, Matthew 1.16, not 1.1. 1, 1. Matthew 1.16, and I'll, I'll turn there. It speaks about the genealogy of Jesus Christ. Verse 15 says, And, Elu, and e, e, Eliud begat Eliezer, and Eliezer begat Mathan, and Mathan begat Jacob. And Jacob begat Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus, who is called the Christ. Where you see, of whom always speaks of possession. Okay? Now, if it was Joseph, then it would say, after Joseph, it would say, of whom was born Christ. But it says, of Mary, of whom was born Christ. The possession is not Joseph, but the possession is Mary. All right? He is the seed of the woman, not the seed of the man. All right? So the fulfillment in Matthew 1.16, also you see it in Luke chapter 1, and Galatians 4.4. 4. All right? Next, the promised seed of Abraham. Christ being the promised seed of Abraham. Genesis 18, 18. Fulfillment, Acts, chapter 3, verse 25. Genesis 18, 18, and Acts 3, 25. Next, the promised seed of Isaac. Genesis 17, verse 9. Fulfillment, Matthew 1, chapter 1, verse 2. And it says this, Abraham begat Isaac, and Isaac begat Jacob, and Jacob begat Judas and his brethren. Matthew chapter 1 speaks of the genealogy of Christ, his line. His line. Okay? Next, promised seed of Jacob. Numbers chapter 24, verse 17 is the, is the prophecy. Fulfillment Luke chapter 3, verse 34. Okay? Next. That Christ would be of the tribe of Judah. Genesis 49, verse 10. Fulfillment. Luke chapter 3, verse 33. That Christ being of the tribe of Judah. Next. Next. It's Genesis chapter 49, verse 10, and Luke chapter 3, verse 33. Next, that Christ would be heir to the throne of David. Isaiah chapter 9, verse 7. Isaiah being a prophet. Fulfillment, Matthew chapter 1, verse 1 and verse 6. Verse 1 says, the book of the generation of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Okay, so the prophecy was in Isaiah 9, 7. The fulfillment is Matthew 1, 1 and 1, 6. Next, prophecy on Christ's place of birth. 
Micah chapter 5, verse 2. Prophesied that he would be born in Bethlehem of Judea. Fulfillment. Matthew chapter 2, verse 1, which says, Now when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem. So we see the prophecy, the fulfillment. Next, the time of Christ's birth. Daniel chapter 9, verse 25. And there's a lot, so I'm, I'm actually not going to give you them all. I'm just giving you a couple. Daniel 9.25, it says this. Now therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem unto the Messiah the Prince shall be seven weeks and threescore and two weeks. The street shall be built again and the wall even in troublous times. The fulfillment, Luke chapter 2, verse 1 and 2. Luke chapter 2, verse 1 and 2. Chapter 2, verse 1 says this. And it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. And this taxing was first made when Cyrenius was governor of Syria. And this is, it speaks about like the timing, the exact timing when Christ would be born was during this time. It wasn't a question, you know. And it just, it shows us how that, like God fulfills his own promise. And, and, and today I was just thinking about that. I was thinking it's amazing. God is the one who fulfills his promise. That's why it says all of his promises are yea and amen in him. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 1. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 20 and 21. All of his promises are in him, yea and amen, to the glory of God by us. Sorry, it's like my mind is like, but it's okay. All right, um, we'll just do a couple more, which is good. Born of a virgin, Isaiah 7, 14. A virgin shall conceive and shall bear a son, and you shall call him Emmanuel, being interpreted God with us. Fulfillment, Matthew chapter 1, verse 18. says this now the birth of Christ was on this wise when as his mother Mary was espoused to Joseph before they came together she was found with child of the Holy Spirit okay uh, I'll give you a couple all right Prophecy, sold for 30 pieces of silver. Christ would be sold for 30 pieces of silver. Zechariah 11, verse 12. Fulfillment, Matthew chapter 26, verse 15. Next. That Christ's side would be pierced, Zechariah 12.10. And the fulfillment was John 19, verse 34. Next, prophecy that not one bone would be broken in Christ's body. Bless you. Psalm 34, verse 20. Fulfillment. John 19, verse 33. Prophecy was Psalm 34, verse 20. Fulfillment was John 19, verse 33. Next, that Christ would be buried or buried with the rich. Isaiah 53, verse 9. It's the prophecy. Fulfillment, Matthew chapter 27, 
verse 57 through 60. So we see here that the prophets foretold of the future. They, and they, they, didn't, they, weren't, they were aware of what they were saying, but they were not aware of the fulfillment of that promise. They were messengers. God knew the fulfillment of the promise. Okay? And the last two um, that we're going to cover, there's, there's a whole lot. But um, prophecy of Christ's resurrection, Psalm 61, verse 10. And we've, we've heard this verse often. I'll read it. It's Psalm 61, verse 10, which says this. Psalm 61, verse 10. 16, verse 10. Wow. Man. Thank you for that clarification. I got my numbers transposed. Psalm 16, verse 10. For thou will not leave my soul in hell, neither will thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. Fulfillment, Matthew 28, verse 9. says verse 9 is that a 9 or man alright let's read verse 6 he is not here for he is risen as he said come and see the place where the Lord lay Yep. You got it? 28.9? Yeah, that's what I thought. Saying, all hail. And he came and held him and held him by the feet and worshipped him. We can do 6 and 9. He's not here, but actually he was risen from the dead where they saw him. And last um, that we're going to cover is Psalm 68, verse 18, speaking about his ascension. Psalm 68, verse 16. Thou hast ascended on high. Thou hast led captivity captive. Thou hast received gifts for men. Yea, for the rebellious also that the Lord God might dwell among them. And the fulfillment is Luke chapter 24, verse 50 and 51, which says this, And he led them out as far as to Bethany, and he lifted up his hands and blessed them. And it came to pass, while he blessed them, he was parted from them and carried up into heaven. And Acts chapter 1, verse 9. Right after the Great Commission, as they were beheading him, he ascended to heaven. So, just those three principles tonight that um, the first three we wanted to cover. And then, as I said, uh, when we come back from the break, we're going to take a short quiz. And then we're going to have Pastor Alfred from Liberia come and close the class with the principle of humility and willingness in illumination all right so we're going to take about a 20 minute break and then we're going to come back and take the quiz and then we're going to come back for the last half an hour finish up the class so lord thank you for this half bless the break bring us back again to the second half in christ's name amen